Welcome to the Indian Council of Medical Research online prescribing skill course 2020 for the Indian medical graduate. I am Dr. Sandeep Kaushal, Professor Head of Pharmacology at the Anand Medical College and Hospital Ludhiana. And today I am going to talk about a module on epilepsy, dementia and migraine. After this video, please answer 5 multiple choice questions on this video and give your feedback. You will find these 5 questions in the assignment section. The authors for this module are myself, Dr. Gagandeep Singh, Professor and Head of Neurology and Dr. Barinder Singh Paul, Professor of Neurology at Dhyanand Medical College and Hospital, Ludhiana. The reviewers for this module are Dr. C.D. Tripathi, Professor and Head of Pharmacology at VMCC Delhi, Dr. Sangeeta Rawat, Professor and Head of Neurology at KEM Mumbai. Now why this topic is important? epilepsy, it affects 1% of world population and is the most common disorder of the brain. It has multifactorial origin, it has multifaceted expression, there is stimulation of a pacemaker neuron which leads to abnormal signals and transient alteration in behavior which manifest as seizures. The abnormalities in neural connections occur due to structural defects, imbalances in neurotransmitters like glutamate and GABA channels like sodium channel or calcium channel due to genetic factors or a combination of all these factors. Now why this topic is important about migraine? It is the most common neurological disorder seen in the OPD. You should be able to differentiate from secondary headaches. You should know when and what to initiate for prophylactic treatment. You should be able to recognize the various precipitating factors and need to know that migraine affects the quality of life. The third topic that is dementia, what is dementia? It is a syndrome which is characterized by a progressive cognitive impairment, impairment in functional abilities and behavioral and psychological symptoms. There are problems with spatial awareness and there are issues with ability to perform activities of daily living independently. Now after the completion of this module on CNS drugs that is epilepsy, dementia and migraine as an IMG you should be able to prescribe rationally for the following conditions that is new onset generalized seizures, status epilepticus, dementia, acute attack of migraine and chronic migraine. You should also be able to communicate effectively with the patient or the attendant regarding the importance of compliance to prescriptions. Now we looked at various topics which are covered in the MCI booklet. Related to this, so these include epilepsy, neurodegenerative disorders, seizures, tumors resulting in seizures, head injury resulting in seizures, febrile seizures, Alzheimer's disease, dementia with Levy bodies, vascular dementia, frontotemporal dementia, migraine with aura, migraine without aura. After discussing with the experts, that is neurologist, we prioritize these two three areas, epilepsy, dementia and migraine. These cover three important aspects of life, migraine mainly seen in young and adults, dementia mainly seen in the elderly population and epilepsy as seen in all the age groups. Now as a physician of first contact, you need to know how you would help treating a patient with epilepsy. There are certain do's, please remember to always start with a single anti-epileptic drug. Start with a low dose and gradually titrate the dose. Add a second anti-epileptic drug only in case of suboptimal control of seizures. Also, explain various adverse effects like sedation, risk of allergic reaction, drug interactions to the family members and the patient before starting anti-epileptic drug for each of them. You need to explain the need for drug compliance and you need to advise for having adequate sleep daily. You need to train the patient to maintain a seizure diary, a sample of which has been provided in the reference material. You need to ask for therapeutic drug monitoring if people with epilepsy have seizures or adverse effects. You need to give folic acid in the dose of 5 mg daily to women with epilepsy in the childbearing age group. Please remember, breastfeeding is not a contraindication to a patient who is suffering from epilepsy and on anti-epileptic drugs. You also need to educate about the precautions to be taken at the time of seizure both to the patient and to the family members. As a physician of first contact, you need to keep the following key points in mind which you should never do when you are trying to treat a patient with epilepsy. Never use multiple anti-epileptic drugs at once. 
Don't use carbamazepine in a patient with myoclonic epilepsy that we will demonstrate in a case shortly. Don't use valproate in women. Do not use alternative form of treatment with antiepileptics. Please remember that these can interfere with the therapeutic efficacy of these drugs and result in breakthrough seizures. Do not use substance of abuse or alcohol in a patient with antiepileptic drugs. Now let's look at a video which shows a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. What you can see now over here, there's a child who is sleeping and now suddenly you see there is a tonic posturing which has started. These are coupled with tonic-clonic movements of both upper limb and lower limb in our epilepsy care unit we have a EEG hooked up to the patient to simultaneously look at the changes which are seen on the EEG as well as what is happening in the manifestations please observe carefully you can look at the face of the patient or you can look at only in the general structure over here of the body you can also see now that there is now up rolling of the eyeballs now this is how a seizure looks like. It is a generalized tonic-clonic seizure as there is involvement of the both upper limb and lower limb. It is associated with tonic and clonic movements which is over there. Remember in a patient with epilepsy this can last up to one minute. Once the seizure is over this child would have a post-ictal confusion which is a normal thing to be seen in patients with epilepsy. Please remember the epileptic seizure is only for the duration for which there is tonic-clonic movements in this patient with generalized tonic-clonic seizures. We need to time the seizures and if possible ask the patients, family members or attendants to make a video with these days mobiles easily having a video feature because when you are going to try to treat these patients as we will see in the subsequent cases videos help us to find out the exact description of the seizure and helps us to find the site of the origin of these abnormal discharges. Now let's look at another example. What you see over here is this is a brief jerky movement of upper limb and trunk. These are called as myoclonic seizures. Now let's try to see another type of seizure in a patient which is absent seizures. Observe this child carefully, see what is happening. You see that there is now an uprolling of eyeballs. It is associated with a vacant stare. But remember from the first video, you do not see any tonic clonic movements. These type of seizures, which are for a short period of time with uprolling of eyeballs and a vacant stare, are called as absence seizures. Remember, these are transient events and the patients do not recognize even having it. As a family member you might observe but because when you are aware that this person has absent seizures your observations become very important. So taking a video at this point would be very useful. Now let us come to a case study. This is a 16 year old boy who is presenting with abnormal involuntary movements progressing to whole body associated with loss of consciousness, frothing from the mouth, urinary incontinence, tongue bite followed by gradual regain of consciousness. He has a history of sleep deprivation a previous night. He also gives a history of falling of objects like toothbrush and cup of tea early in the morning. There is no past history of fever, headache, vomiting, focal neurological deficit or trauma, no history of substance abuse and no family history of similar episodes. On general physical examination, there is nothing remarkable. Similarly, there is nothing in cardiovascular, respiratory, abdomen examination and there is no abnormality on CNS examination. Now, what is your probable diagnosis? This patient probably has a generalized tonic-clonic seizure with myoclonic jerks. Now, how would we investigate this case? We need to find out what are the various causes which could lead to seizures. So therefore, we need to have a complete blood count, a blood sugar, renal function test, serum electrolytes, liver function test, thyroid function test, lipid profile and vitamin. Remember the liver function test, lipid profile and vitamin D, they basically serve as a background test to find out what is the status if we want to start the patient on antiepileptics and if there are any changes in the form of transaminitis, adverse lipid profile or adverse bone profile. So what do we see? 
Once the investigations are available, we see that complete blood counts, blood sugars, renal function test, serum electrolytes, lipid profile, liver function test, thyroid function test and vitamin levels are within normal limits. Now, based on the history, based on the clinical examination, based on these investigations, we make a diagnosis of primary generalized epilepsy with myoclonic epilepsy. What is the basis of this diagnosis? The basis is history of jerky movements, falling objects from hand in the morning and generalized seizures which have been seen from the witness. Seizures which occurred after sleep deprivation, this patient is in second decade of life, there is a negative family history, there are no neurocutaneous markers. Why it is important? Because certain types of epilepsies do occur if there are tumors in the brain or in the spinal cord like neurofibromatosis type 1. In this patient, Velprate is the first line for the treatment of primary generalized epilepsy as per ILE guidelines. The other options include Lamotrigine, Levitracetam and Topiramate. Now let us see an algorithm how we would evaluate this patient when he comes to us in an OPT. Remember to confirm the details from eyewitness or a video recording. If there are none available, rule out other causes of altered behavior. If they are available and this is a first episode which is there and diagnostic facilities in the form of CT or MRI available, please get it done to rule out neurocysticercosis or a structural lesion. If these facilities are not available, we need to discuss the treatment options both with the patient and the family, need to need discuss about the need for compliance and awareness of various adverse drug reactions in these patients. Once we have done this, we need to select a drug based on the seizure type, epilepsy syndrome, availability, affordability and adverse drug profile. Please find attached a document on the various drugs which are used in different types of epilepsies, their doses and their adverse effects which are seen in the supplementary material provided to you. Once we have selected the drug, start low and go slow. Monitor the seizure control and if adequate, we can continue the treatment for minimum of 2 years before taking a decision to taper off or not. However, in case seizures are not controlled, patient goes into status epilepticus or has adverse effects, we need to refer this to a neurologist. Similarly, if there are some defects on neuroimaging in the form of neurocysticercosis or a structural lesion, it is always better to consult a neurologist. Remember, the patients can also present with status epilepticus. What is status epilepticus? Status epilepticus is defined as a seizure occurring for 5 minutes or more close together and the patient does not recover between these seizures. If you are able to see this patient outside the hospital and you have availability of buccal or internasal mirazolam, we can use it to abort the seizure. Or the patient can come to you at your primary health center or to the clinic, prefer to use one of the benzodiazepines according to availability, diazepam, dorazepam or midazolam, all these are to be given in the doses as mentioned over here by IV root. This is to be followed by use of anti-epileptic drugs, IV phenytoin or valproate or phenobarbitone as are given in the doses over here. In case the seizures are not controlled, this patient needs to be referred to a higher center. Similarly, if you do not have anti-epileptic drugs at your center or available, after giving the treatment with a benzodiazepine, you can refer straight away to a higher center. It is very important for you to know these drugs for the management of status epilepticus. The details are given in the handout. Now try to look at what are the drugs that we need to use for our patient that we are discussing. The first line agents for generalized tonic-clonic seizures are sodium valproate, lamotrigine, levitracetam and topiramate. Now how to choose a drug? Valproate remember is preferred for males, levitracetam is preferred for female patients and remember carbamazepine is contraindicated if generalized seizures are associated with myoclonic seizures. Now let us write a prescription for a patient over here. So as this is a male patient, so we will prefer to use sodium valproate. We will start with 200 milligrams two times a day and then increase it to 500 milligrams twice a day. We need to follow up after one month and then gradually after another month so that we know what is the seizure control like. We provide a patient with seizure diary, a sample of which has been provided in the reference material. You can go through the same. We need to investigate as I discussed with you earlier when we discussed the cases over here and based on this, we have started the patient on sodium valproate. Please remember, this patient would require a specialist care if seizures are not controlled, patient has status epilepticus. 
Now, briefly discuss about another type of seizures which are febrile seizures which can come across in your practice. As the name indicates febrile seizures they are associated with high grade fever. Classically they are seen in young children in the age group of 3 years up to 3 years from 3 months. Now, what happens? As the name indicates these are the seizures which are associated with high grade fever and they occur because of a rapid change in the temperature. They do not cause a lasting problem. They are of two types simple and complex seizures. Simple seizures occur only once they are associated with loss of consciousness, rhythmic twitching of limbs or convulsions, confusion or tiredness after the episode. Whereas complex febrile seizures they last more than 15 minutes and there could be multiple seizures in more than 24 hours. Now what is the differential diagnosis? We need to know that a child presenting with seizures and fever could be suffering from meningitis so please do a kerning test or it could be even encephalitis or brain abscess for which we need to do a CSF examination. If you do not have the facilities please refer to a higher center. Now, as a physician of first contact there are certain things that you must do when you see a patient with febrile seizure. Please roll onto the child to one side, time the seizures and remove or move any objects that can cause harm during convulsions like fissure, like furniture or sharp items. There are certain things which you must avoid if you see a patient with febrile seizures and also teach the parents as well as the family members to avoid doing them. Do not put anything into their mouth and do not restrict the movement of convulsions or twitchings. Now what is the treatment? As mentioned early that it is because of fever hence called as febrile seizure so the main stay of the treatment is paracetamol. In certain patients we need to use anti-seizure medications if there are recurrent febrile seizures or other risk factor present. We can also use intranasal midazolam in these children. Remember epilepsy is a common disorder which you see in the OPD over here but there are certain errors which you must avoid. These errors observed are remember seizures have a multifactorial etiology it could be epileptogenic or non-epileptogenic. Remember it is a transient alteration of behavior so it can be missed. Epilepsy being unprovoked may be difficult to diagnose in the absence of an observer. Remember epilepsy is associated with a lot of stigma so people with epilepsy may not reveal the diagnosis or the manifestations. Even at times imaging and EEG may be non-conclusive. So in the absence of definitive history, in the absence of a witness and assess to investigative mortalities it may be difficult to diagnose and hence treat epilepsy. This results in irrational use of medicines and that is why we have considered this one of the topics that you must know in this module. In addition to this remember all type of healthcare professionals like general practitioners, internal medicine specialists, psychiatrists, neurologists and neurosurgeons are involved in providing healthcare. So people with epilepsy may be receiving a wrong anti-epileptic drug. For example, in the first scenario that we talked about if we give carbamazepine instead of sodium valproate it could result in worsening of seizures. People might think as a manifestation of a psychotic disorder and put them on antipsychotics or diagnose them as a mood stabilizer resulting in inappropriate use. Please remember all these people are competent to treat. Neurosurgeons definitely would be the preferred treatment physicians in case you find some organic disorder which is there resulting in structural defects. Neurologists would help you to treat these patients over here. Similarly psychiatrists would be treating these patients who have psychotic disorders or psychiatric disorders with epilepsy and similarly you as a general practitioner or internal medicine specialist would also be treating them. So the carry home message is establish the diagnosis of epilepsy before starting treatment when in doubt or in case of unexpected situation refer to a specialist. Remember conventional antiepileptics are as effective as newer antiepileptics and they should generally be the first line of treatment. Remember the dictum of start low and go slow for antiepileptic drugs. Initial treatment always with monotherapy gradually add another antiepileptic drug if seizures are not controlled with the first drug. Remember epilepsy can be controlled in two third of these patients. Train the patients to maintain seizure diary because that is the only record which you will know that this event happened. Ensure a regular follow up and always stress upon the compliance to therapy. Ask the patient to revert back in case seizure develops or there is an adverse drug effect. Remember to consider anti-epileptic drug withdrawal after two years of seizure free interval always caution the family and the patient that there is a risk of resurgence of these episodes. So one must be very careful and 
explain to them very carefully. Try to dispel the myths which are associated with epilepsy, look out for drug interactions and advice for contraception, pregnancy and breastfeeding. Do not switch antiepileptics in pregnancy or otherwise as they could cause more harm than benefit and always make family members partners in patient care. Now coming to the second aspect that is dementia. What is dementia? Dementia is a syndrome of chronic or progressive nature with a deterioration in cognitive function that is ability to process thought beyond what is expected from normal aging process. It affects a number of components, memory, thinking, orientation, learning capability, judgment and so on. Please remember in dementia consciousness is not affected. The impairment of cognitive function is commonly accompanied and occasionally preceded by deterioration in emotion control, social behavior or motivation. Here are the listed symptoms which are suggestive of dementia. They could be as simple as impaired memory, forgetting learning activities, depression, sleep disturbances and even personality changes. Now, what are the do's as a physician of first contact? Always advise these patients with dementia to wear an ID card which talks about their name, about their address and their disease that is suffering from dementia. Advise family members to always interact with these patients. Talk to a patient in a calm, reassuring tone that conveys respect and dignity. Please use physical contact like a pat on a shoulder or hand holding if appropriate. Use visual clues wherever possible. Observe and attempt to interpret person's non-verbal communications. Speak slowly and say individual words clearly. Use strategies to reduce the effect of hearing impairment as majority of these patients would be elderly. There are certain things which you must train your patients to avoid if they are suffering from dementia. Ask them to refrain from using alcohol. Ask them to not use excessive sedative drugs. Do not allow them to drive alone. Do not allow them to go to crowded places alone as they may get lost. Always ask a family member to accompany. Now these are certain reversible causes of dementia. These includes vitamin deficiencies, thyroid dysfunction, infections, use of various anticholinergic drugs, substance abuse, traumas, metabolic disorders, heart diseases and even environmental factors. So therefore when we are trying to evaluate these patients we need to find out whether there are reversible causes or irreversible. Therefore the lab investigations cover up these in the form of complete blood counts, serum electrolytes, blood glucose albumin and serum proteins, vitamin B12 and folate levels, renal and hepatic function, thyroid function test and urine analysis. These investigations will file out whether there are any correctable or contributor causes of dementia. In addition to this, if you want to rule out infarcts, mass lesions, tumors or hydrocephalus, we can do a CT with contrast or magnetic imaging. There are various neuropsychological tools available. We have provided you with a copy of mini mental state examination and Montreal cognitive assessment in the supplementary which you can go through. Mini mental examination and this Montreal cognitive assessment, they are easy to do. You can do on an OPD basis. Now this is an algorithm that you need to follow when you are treating a patient with dementia. Get the history, do a detailed physical examination and determine whether there is a cognitive decline in more than one domain. If no, then this patient is not suffering from dementia. But if yes, you suspect dementia, order the lab investigations as discussed early, do neuropsychiatric testing and find out whether there is a reversible cause or not. If there is a reversible cause, treat the reversible cause. If there is none of these tests come out to be diagnosing a reversible cause, probably this patient has degenerative dementia and this is a patient which needs to be sent to a higher center. Also, if there is a functional decline, refer this patient directly to a higher center so that the treatment can be started by the experts. Now, what are the common errors which you observe when you treat a patient with dementia? Remember, dementia is underdiagnosed worldwide and most do not get a diagnosis. It involves multiple cognitive domains which differentiates it from amnestic disorder which only involves impairment of memory. These cognitive defects cause significant impairment in social occupational functioning thus distinguishing it from mild cognitive impairment and remember this may not cause significant impairment in functioning. It can be divided into different types Alzheimer's disease, dementia with Levy bodies, vascular dementia and frontotemporal dementia. 
we have tried to give you the different points which can differentiate these types of dementia in the supplementary material provided to you. Remember dementia can also be caused by other medical or neurological conditions or could be caused by exposure to various medications like antidepressants, sedatives, corticosteroids and anticonvulsants. So drug history and other reversible causes must be ruled out so that we can give a effective treatment to these patients with dementia. So the carry home message for the patients with dementia is remember all dementias are not irreversible or degenerative. So there are reversible causes which must be investigated and if present they must be treated. If you have a degenerative dementia start with one drug and gradually add another drug if there is no improvement. Ideally, these patients should be treated by the experts which have better exposure to the drugs and handling of these patients. Now coming on to the third part of this presentation, we discuss it with this case. It is a 20 year old female teacher who has come to the OPD with the complaints of flashes of light followed by unilateral throbbing headache and nausea lasting 4 to 5 hours. There is a history of these attacks in the past which are interfering with her work. There is no concomitant history of other disorders. There is no remarkable family history. On general physical examination, there is nothing remarkable, there is normal fundus, systemic examination does not reveal any abnormality on cardiovascular, respiratory, abdominal examination or CNS examination. So what is the probable diagnosis? Probably this patient has acute migraine. So what investigations do you need? As any patient who presents with atypical features or has acute onset of headache with nausea and vomiting, you must get an imaging to rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage. So if we get an MRI scan done over here, it is coming out to be normal, then we need to list out what are the problems for this patient. This patient has headache with aura, nausea and disturbed quality of life. Now we have made this diagnosis of acute migraine on the basis of history, general physical examination and investigations. The pointers are the age of onset is in second to fourth decade, there is history of unilateral throbbing headache with visual aura, history of nausea. Duration of headache more than 4 hours, there are repeated episodes in the past, there is nothing remarkable on general or systemic examination and even neuroimaging is normal. So how do we manage these patients? The first line of treatment is to use of non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. We can use paracetamol, naproxen or indomethacin with or without anti-emetics. We can use triptans, we can also use ergot derivatives. Please remember triptans they are highly effective but no triptan should be used concurrently with or without ergot derivatives within 24 hours so as to avoid the risk of ischemia. Now let us write a prescription for this patient. So we prefer tablet paracetamol 650 milligram and we give an option of using naproxen in 500 milligram or indomethacin 50 milligram if there is no relief. This patient requires lifestyle changes, she needs to avoid stress, have minimum of 6 hours of sleep and need to avoid triggers. Please find in the supplementary material over here there is a list of triggers which are there possible but for each patient you need to find out what are the triggers and need to avoid these triggers. We follow this patient after 2 weeks and then after 1 month and in case this episodes are not controlled so obviously this patient needs a referral to a specialist. So investigation we already have discussed so what is the need to do this investigation. Now let us see another type of presentation over here. Now this is a 34 year old female, a housewife who is presenting with history of frequent headaches for the last 4 to 5 years. The headaches are pulsating, unilateral with photophobia and nausea lasting 4 to 6 hours. The current episode is for the last 5 hours started since morning. Associated with photophobia and nausea, she gives a history of inadequate sleep because of a family function. There is nothing contributory in the past history or nothing remarkable in the family history. On general physical examination, we find nothing remarkable over here. The fundus and visual acuity are normal. On systemic examination, there is no abnormality which is seen over here. So what is the probable diagnosis? The probable diagnosis is chronic migraine. So what investigation need? Similarly, though this is an acute attack over here, but still a neuroimaging would help and this will help us to rule out if there is any other cause which could be causing severe headache and nausea and vomiting. So what are the patient problems? These include severe headache, nausea, photophobia and sleep deprivation. So what we can do for this patient? We make a diagnosis on the basis of history with the pointers are unilateral headache, photophobia, nausea. Her age is within the general age which is seen in patient with migraine that is second to fourth decade. She has a normal neurological examination as well as general physical examination. The neuroimaging done comes out to be normal. 
So, what are the guidelines? So, this is a patient which now require a treatment for prophylaxis. We can use beta blockers, tricyclic antidepressants, flunarazine, divalprex or topiramate. Remember beta blockers and tricyclic antidepressants are highly effective with minimum risk. If you want to use beta blockers, you should avoid them if there is a history of asthma, bradycardia or conduction defect, preferably ECG should be done before starting beta blockers. Tricyclic antidepressants are to be avoided in patients with benign prostatic hyperplasia. So, what would be the drug of choice for this patient? We will prefer to use propanolol. Why? Because she is in the second to fourth decade of life. She has repeated attacks but no comorbidities which make up use of beta blocker contraindication. Propanolol is effective, well tolerated, safe, easy to titrate and cost effective. Please remember we need to warn the patient about need for compliance because they become non-complacent because of the events not occurring more frequently. So, when we write a prescription, so we need to treat both the acute as well as the chronic factors. So, we give parastamol or we give option of giving naproxen or indomethacin in case there is no relief and we need to start on propanolol. We start with 20 milligrams once a day for 7 days and then twice a day for total of 2 months. This is also to be associated with lifestyle changes, avoiding stress, minimum 6 hours of sleep and avoid a trigger as discussed earlier. She needs to maintain a headache diary, a copy of which has been provided in the supplementary material over here. We need to follow up after 2 weeks and then after 2 months. In case the headaches are not controlled, she needs to be referred to a physician. Now, what is the carry home message for patient with migraine? So, migraine affects quality of life, reduces our work days. Though migraine cannot be cured, but we can reduce disability by giving prophylactic treatments. Use prophylactic treatment to reduce the incidence of analgesic overuse and conversion of episodic migraine into chronic daily headaches. So, these are the references which we have used for making this presentation over here with you. And these are my contributors. So, these include my department colleagues, Dr. Shalini Roda, Professor of Pharmacology, Dr. Kanchan Gupta is also Professor of Pharmacology, my colleagues from Neurology, Dr. Gagandeep Singh and Dr. Brinder Singh Paul, my colleagues from Psychiatry, Dr. Ranjeev Mahajan, Dr. Navkiran Mahajan, Dr. Sangeeta Girthar from the Department of Community Medicine, Dr. Sahil, a resident from my department and interns Amit, Rashpal, Mandeep, Ankit, Prabhleen, Amanat Garewal, Nancy and Ishita. I also thank ICMR for the support in providing standard treatment workflows. I also thank my experts for their constructive comments. Dear friends, thank you for watching this video. Hope you are not ready for attempting these MCQs. Please access the MCQs in the assignment section and submit the answers. Please also complete the prescription evaluation as per the tutorial which I hope you have already seen. Thank you and wishing you a happy learning.